our next speaker is Jess Smith. Jess is speaking on enhancing psychedelic therapy through mental health interventions. Welcome, Jess. Thank you. How many of you have done psychedelics or plan to? Just kidding. Don't answer that. Don't go raising your virtual hands. I'm just trying to catch your attention. And now that I've caught your attention, I'm going to share with you some somatic practices that are necessary when integrating psychedelic experiences, but are not necessarily standardized in psychedelic therapy. Now, the information I'm going to share with you today is nothing new. In fact, you likely already know this stuff. So I'd like my talk to serve as a reminder and as motivation to get back to these important practices and make them daily habits. And perhaps if you plan to do or use psychedelics for therapy, my story might provide some insight. Well, let me tell you, I wish that I had known about Stanislav Grof prior to my first psychedelic experience. Grof said, many of us who have experienced psychedelics feel very much that they are sacred tools. They open spiritual awareness. Well, when I first tried psychedelics, my first experience, I did not know that it was gonna open me up. I did not see it as a sacred tool until many years later. And when I look back on my experience, I realized that my journey had naturally led me to an integration method or integration methods perfect for cultiv cultivating and opening into spiritual awareness. Briefly, what is integration? Integration refers to the process of incorporating specific events, whether traumatic or not, into a unified understanding of the entire journey, the whole. In other words, Integration facilitates meaning making. When you're practicing integration, you're seeking to understand the root cause of suffering. You are seeking to mend that which is broken. You are taking action with the intent to heal. And when it comes to current integration methods offered, as mentioned before, mainstream psychotherapy falls short of meeting the needs of their vastly diverse patient population, particularly those of color. Because the generational trauma of people of color have endured has been a physical trauma or physical in nature, talk therapy, which is the main form of integration currently used, may not be enough. So let me tell you my story of my first time with psychedelics. I was at a weekend rave in Lake Havasu, Arizona. The mountains and the hills around us were shades of red and the lake was just a few steps from the hotel. Over a thousand college students littered the area, music playing and lights flashing. As the MDMA settled into my body, I felt a tingling sensation all over, along with the urge to dance and move. And my body was vibrating with this intense happiness that I'd never felt before. I hadn't known this level of joy existed until that moment. And it was, it was truly an expansive experience, and as some of you might know. However, I was not prepared for what came next. As I mentioned before, I didn't know psychedelics facilitated a spiritual opening. So in the following months, as my repressed trauma began to surface and bubble up, I struggled emotionally and mentally to regain that sense of happiness or any sense of happiness, or at least contentment in the moment. I didn't know what the hell was wrong with me. I couldn't get out of bed. I started to feel lost. I had a wonderful relationship, but I found it difficult to just be in a space of gratitude. The term spiritual emergency was first coined by Groff and his wife to describe a state in which a pac patient is struggling with mental afflictions like depression, anxiety, addiction, low energy, lack of motivation, and the inability to find meaning and joy. In other words, an opportunity to emerge to rise to a higher level of psychological functioning and spiritual awareness, as Graf puts it. This is what was happening to me. I was having a spiritual emergency, but again, I didn't know this. After months of feeling unmotivated towards life, I went to therapy in hopes that I could discover a way to be happy again. And the first practice I learned was becoming aware of my breath moving in and out of my body. The breath something we do each day, but we're not really often aware of it. And I'm not, and I'm sure it's no surprise to you that our breath is linked to our emotions. 
The slower and deeper our breath, the calmer we feel. The faster our breath, the more we feel anxious, nervous, or even afraid. In yoga, we call this deep breathing the complete breath, or dirga, if you want to be fancy. The practice begins by taking in a deep breath from the lower belly and filling the entire, entire chest with air. Let's try this together. So placing a hand on your lower belly, and if you'd like to, you can place the other hand on your chest. Give yourself some proprioception. Inhale from the lower belly and fill your entire chest with air. Exhale and notice your chest fall and your belly tighten. Let's try it one more time. Thanks for joining me on that one. Now, when you realize or when you utilize this breathing technique, not only will you help calm your mind, but you'll engage 100% of your core muscles. So if getting a cinched waist is motivating for you, I encourage you to implement Dirga breath in your daily routine. According to researchers, breath work, also called pranayama, can improve symptoms of respiratory, respiratory diseases like COPD. Pranayama helps to relieve anxiety, fatigue, emotional distress in cancer patients, patients suffering from cardiovascular disease, as well as hypertension. And researchers conclude that there are both physiological and psychological benefits of pranayama. An article discussing breath work in psychotherapy states, when breathing is unconscious, it relies on imprinted patterns. And these patterns are both genetically inherited as well as learned in early development. Have you learned dysfunctional breathing patterns? Did you experience something that may, may have caused your breath to alter its pattern? It should be noted that not all breathing exercises are appropriate for traumas. For example, a breathing technique known as Kapalabhati, which involves, involves rapid shallow breaths, <laughs> can cause feelings of anxiety. <laughs> so it's important to consider which breathing practice is right for you. The next practice I learned and implemented daily was meditation. Many of us admit that meditation is not easy. We find it difficult to silence the mind or become easily distracted by sounds. However, the meditation I first learned and I'm about to share with you is super easy for those of us who struggle to stop thinking. This meditation is called three by three. We begin this meditation by taking some deep breaths just as we did. So perhaps you'd like to join me in taking some deep breaths. Then, bringing your awareness to the sounds around you. Let's try this together. And if you'd like, you can close your eyes and see if you can hear three different sounds and no need to label them, just take note. Next, bring your awareness into your body. Notice the sensations around you and see if you can feel three different sensations. Taking another deep breath, flutter your eyes open and notice three things around you. And I like to find things that remind me of beauty or bring me joy. Now let's come back, taking a last deep breath and on your exhale, maybe you wanna shake your body and shake your arms. How do you feel? Simple, right? I invite you to put this meditation in your pocket if it resonates with you. In a pilot study where 23 naive meditators were asked to chant OM for 30 minutes, researchers discovered that the theta brainwave increases after this meditation significantly, just 30 minutes of chanting. The theta state, as some of you may know, is a state of deep relaxation. Another case study examining the use of meditation for patients with various chronic illnesses concludes that successful healing 
is almost inevitably linked to new recognitions and perceptions, changes in attitudes or changes in lifestyle. Meditation facilitates healing. So I was meditating every day, three to four times a day. Anytime I felt this heaviness setting on me, my meditation practice allowed me to see that anger protected me from further trauma and that anger was useful for a time, but that it was holding me back from achieving a higher state of existence. The inner quiet that I was allowing myself to have gave me the opportunity to reflect on the trauma I wished to release. It was as if my body was trapped with trauma inside of it. I would meditate and I'd be fine for a while, then contentment would dissipate after time. My body, my mind was starting to integrate, but my body was not, so I needed something else. Not long after I started a daily meditation practice, I was invited to do hot yoga. I'd never done yoga before. I barely knew anything about it. So hot yoga was my first, very first class. What a way to go. The movements and long holds, along with the intention to breathe through the heat, reset my mental state completely. Now I'm naturally an active person. I played sports and practiced martial arts, but I didn't realize until that hot yoga class that I had not been physically active as I once was. Each time I went to yoga class, my body felt lighter. I felt as if the heaviness would just stay away forever. In an article discussing the mental health benefits of yoga, it states that one of the many tools employed by yoga is deconditioning. The yogic method teaches the individual to evaluate thoroughly our actions. My body and mind were conditioned to hold on to anger, to pain, to guilt, and to shame. With yoga asana, the, the practice of postures, I was able to release the tension held in my body. I was able to recondition my body and orient towards peace, relaxation, and happiness. Now the movement that is calling you might not be yoga. It might be boxing or martial arts, a controlled environment in which you can release anger in cathartic ways. Whatever practice is calling you, I encourage you to answer the call. I encourage you to practice a releasing method, a releasing through movement. Psychedelics, as you now know through my story, if you didn't before, facilitate a noumenal, a noumenal experience, which takes place in both the psyche and the body. Psychedelic experiences serve as a catalyst for spiritual openings, a catalyst for reconditioning. According to a recent cell report, Researchers found that psychedelics increase the density of dendritic spines. Now, what is that? Well, dendrites are these pathways that connect from one neuron to the next. And along this pathway are dendritic spines, which are like protrus protrusions that branch out. And this is where synapses associated with memory are located. Scientists who I got to interview briefly at a conference who conducted this particular study I'm talking about, admit that these synapses might be associated with what Groff calls coex systems or systems of complex experiences, which are groups of emotionally charged memories from different periods of our life that resemble each other in the quality of emotion or physical sensation they share. In other words, the regrowth of these synapses might be the reason we enter into a state of spiritual emergency. As our brain begins to recall and resurface repressed and forgotten events. And I think that's what was happening to me. And a spiritual, enter, enter, a spiritual emergency requires a spiritual intervention. And mental health interventions like pranayama, breathwork, meditation, and yoga, which began as spiritual practices, have proven to be effective tools to help usher in a transformation of self. If you find yourself experiencing symptoms of a spiritual crisis, whether it was psychedelically induced or not, I encourage you to take on a form of these practices to help gather the pieces of self and bring them into a unified understanding of your entire journey. Namaste. Thank you so much, Jess, for that beautiful journey of integration and, and also for the breathwork practices that you shared that are so very 
relaxing and I think needed at this time of day as well as perhaps this time of semester or time of year. Um, are there some questions for Jess? Jess shared a lot about um, how to integrate various experiences into our lives. Anyone want some more detail? Again, I can't see everyone, so you can also use the raise hand function or you can unmute yourself if you have a question. Uh, just I'm, I appreciate your uh, presentation. I'm curious if you have, um, and you actually might have said this, I'm, I'm not sure, um, but your thoughts on uh, experience with uh, holotropic breathing or um, or uh, your thoughts on Sri Aurobindo's integral yoga uh, as it relates to your own practices um, and just thought I'd invite you to speak on, on that. Thank you. Though. Thank you for that question. Yeah, actually, um, if, I, if I could recall the article that's in my paper um, regarding this topic about holotropic breathing, it there is a study conducted with HB, as it's called, and it was deemed very successful to help patients um, who are going through some type of chronic illness or to help them achieve a place where they're okay um, and accepting of, of their physical state of being at, at that time. Um, so yeah, I think it can definitely be helpful, but I think it's important to note that even in holotropic breathing, like Groff would say that it's not necessarily the breathing that uh, facilitates this shift. It's like the reflection during the breathing. It's the, it's the new perception that we're creating through this moment of silence and inner, inner exploration. Um, but I do think that the breath is the facilitating factor. Like if we're gonna go on an adventure, it's the vehicle that's gonna take us where we wanna go. Thank you. Thank you for that um, interesting question and the further discussion. Are there other questions out there or comments? Oh, Jake, please go ahead. Sure. Thanks for that presentation, Justin, for uh, inviting us to ground some a bit. I really, like Elizabeth said, I really appreciate that at this point in the day, the semester, the year, all of it. Um, I wonder if you could say anything more about the way that the uh, the kind of integration work that you were describing at a sort of personal level uh, the implications of that maybe for uh, at the collective level as these kind of practices and approaches become more uh, more present in at least portions of our society. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. So, you know, like the, the PCC, our goal as students who are coming out of PCC is to make an impact somewhere in our community. And we're, and we're really focused on consciousness. So it's my belief that if we can implement these things, not, not just for psychedelic use necessarily, but if we can just implement them in our daily life, then we can change collectively. Um, who was it, was it a talk today that it occurred? I'm getting all mashed up, but you know, once you heal the self, you can go ahead and heal others collectively out there. So yeah, I think it begins with us. I think it begins with taking these tools to go inward because we're so distracted and we're being pulled in many directions out externally. Um, and without these, what other tools do we have other than these tools that are ancient that facilitate that, that inner exploration um, other than psychedelics too. But you, know, you don't necessarily need to do psychedelics. I'm not advocating for drug use. <laughs> I'm just, it is a real thing. And we do often have these these crises come up within us and, and what do we do if just talking about it isn't enough so yeah I think we can collectively change and shift how we treat each other even just by going back to the breath thank you no that's great I love it I love the encouragement to go back to the breath 
Awesome, Jess. And I, I just want to underscore one of the first things that you said. Um, you mentioned that um, embodied practices and breath work are especially important for people of color whose communities might have experienced um, somatic oppression or somatic trauma. Um, and I, I just think that's such an important thing to bring forward that um, that histories of trauma ripple through generations and um, and and have to be um, explored and addressed somatically. So I, I wanted to emphasize that point at, at the beginning of your talk. Thank you for that. Thanks. Absolutely. We 